Dr. Sarah Schnitker from the Thrive Center at Fuller Theological Seminary to speak to us today. Um, professor Sch Dr. Schnitker is an assistant professor um, at Fuller. She did her undergraduate work uh, at Grove City College and her graduate degree in personality and social psychology at UC Davis. While at UC Davis, she was working with Dr. Bob Emmons, uh, many of Many of you know Dr. Bob Emmons, so he uh, studies character strength and, and virtue development, particularly gratitude. Um, so Sarah is uh, the recipient of a John Templeton Foundation grant in character development in adolescence. Um, and particular, she is particularly interested in virtue formation. Um, and uh, she has done work and is interested in the role of spirituality and religion in virtue formation. Um, she's interested in self-control and patience. And the title of her talk today, as you can see, is Character Strength Development in Adolescence. How does religion affect the formation of virtues and the efficacy of interventions? So please help me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Schnitt. everyone. Thanks so much for having me come and speak. Um, I've heard that you've been doing kind of a series and thinking a lot about positive psychology um, this year. And so this is an area of study I've been involved in um, for a long time, I guess since 2000, um, and really something I'm quite excited about. And so today, um, we're going to talk about virtue interventions and character strength interventions. Um, and as some of you may know, that since the late 1990s, um, there's been a plethora of interventions that have been scientifically tested um, that show that if you increase a person's character strength, um, it also increases their subjective well-being. The um, problem is that a lot of these interventions are presented just as a way to get happy, as a way to feel personally satisfied in life, um, and they're often presented in a context that's devoid of any moral meaning um, or spiritual meaning. And so it's just presented, you want to get happy? Well, here you go. Try this out. Keep a gratitude journal. Um, but you'll find that researchers in positive psychology actually warn against this. Um, that we find that when you pursue happiness just for its own sake, um, that often doesn't work very well. Um, that you need another reason um, of why you are doing these activities. Um, researchers also distinguish just feeling happy, so having positive emotions, few negative emotions, and life satisfaction. They distinguish that from human flourishing and thriving. Um, so just feeling good about your life isn't necessarily enough to say this is a life that's well lived. Um, we have other criteria we'd also want to look at. So how a person is functioning relationally, how virtuous they are. Um, we can call these things eudaimonic well-being. Um, in the tradition of Aristotle. And I argue that it's important to see virtues as a, not a means to an end of happiness, but as important outcomes themselves. So these are things that we should strive to foster um, in our communities. Now traditionally, um, if you look back in history, Virtue formation has not been done in the context of psychology. We didn't really have psychology, right, until modern times. Um, but virtue formation was located in the church um, or other religious institutions. And that virtue formation was really had this overarching purpose of honoring God, honoring your community, um, perhaps honoring ancestors, that you were trying to form your moral character for this sacred reason. And you also see in the psychological literature um, in the last 50 years that we find that sanctification of mundane goals and activities changes the way people engage in goal pursuit. Um, so you could take a goal, like I want to be a good parent. This isn't necessarily a spiritual goal. Um, but many people imbue that goal with sacred meaning, that this is an activity that's ordained by God and that this is really important, and God cares about how I do this activity, and this is a sacred call. And so we find in research on sanctified goals that when goals are imbued with sacred meaning, um, that people pursue them with more effort. Um, they actually have a higher rate of achieving those goals. Um, 
and also that the outcome of that goal that's sanctified has a greater impact on their subjective well-being. Um, so if you achieve a goal that's sanctified, you feel really good. Um, and likewise, if you fail at a goal that's really sacred to you, it has a more negative impact on your um, self. And so, looking at the sanctification literature and also the fact that virtue formation has taken place in religious contexts, um, I'm arguing that the religious context and a person's own spirituality will actually facilitate virtue formation, that there might be something different about the formation of virtues in the church than in a secular context. And in the Christian religion, which we're a Christian institution here, I'm at a seminary, a Christian seminary, um, this bodes really well and it matches up with our theology. Um, so if we think about this idea of spiritual fruit in Christianity, it's the idea that if you're experiencing genuine spiritual growth and God is actually moving in your life and the spirit is at work, that you should see this evidenced in the formation of virtue. Um, we have the classic Galatians text on the fruit of the Spirit, that these are qualities that evidence God's work in your life. Um, we also have texts that would indicate if you fail to see virtues developing in a person, you might question whether or not they're actually growing spiritually. And so this is really a core um, idea that's presented in the New Testament. And so I'm very interested in spiritual formation and transformation and thinking about what changes when someone grows spiritually and how does spiritual growth affect a person psychologically. Um, and I think this is probably something you guys think about around here too of spiritual formation. How do we make this happen? What does it look like? Um, so from a psychological standpoint, Leffel proposes that there's really three psychological um, groups of things that happen to people when they experience spiritual formation and transformation. Okay? And so the first one is that there might be an increase in epistemic functioning. So what we mean here is that the person increases in their knowledge of God. They also perhaps get a better sense of meaning and purpose in their life. Um, that their spiritual growth can help them answer existential questions um, about life, and that this would be an area of increased um, functioning for the individual. Leffel argues that the second domain is in the intrapsychic domain. So that you see this in the research when people show spiritual growth. They also show higher health. They live longer, they're healthier. They report more satisfaction with life. They're happier. Um, that the spirituality somehow affects their psychological intrapsychic functioning. The third domain is what Leffel calls moral sociability. And so here he says that spiritual formation and transformation lead to a new way of engaging in the social context, in this moral community. And that this can be measured and kind of quantified at the individual level as an increase in virtues. So how is it that you can better engage in your moral community? Well, you can learn how to love. You can learn how to be kind. You can learn how to have self-control and patience. Um, not yell at someone when you're angry, but instead be able to deal with them patiently. Um, and so Leffel argues that actually this last area of functioning is the key component. This is the primary function, he says of spiritual transformation. Um, and it really says that the point of this is to strengthen the moral community. And he bases this argument on evolutionary psychology. Um, so the idea that religion can increase, increase the fitness of a group of people, that when they're more pro-social and virtuous, they survive at the group level better. Um, he argues this based on religious studies. Um, Armstrong says that Religion was more about the way of living rather than knowing certain things in the past, and it's only since the Enlightenment that it's become so focused on head knowledge. Um, and he also argues this from Jonathan Haidt and Craig Joseph's social intuitionist approach to morality. Um, unfortunately, in the psychology of religion research area, 
you find that the epistemic and intracyclic functionalist accounts have really received the most attention research-wise. Um, and hardly anyone's looked at how um, having formation, spiritual formation or transformation can increase our moral sociability. And so this leads me to two major research questions. Um, and I'm gonna really address both of these in our talk today with two different studies. So the first question is, how does spiritual formation, or just does spiritual formation and transformation predict subsequent increases in virtues? So previous research has shown that these things are correlated. The people who are higher in spirituality are also higher in virtue. Um, but maybe it's because virtuous people are attracted to religion, right? It could be a selection effect. So we wanna see, well, does actually having a change in your spirituality then predict a change in your virtue? And the second question is how religiousness, spirituality, and beliefs about God, how would this influence the efficacy of an intervention that's trying to directly increase someone's virtues? Right? So if we present virtues as a religious activity or a spiritual activity of the activity, um, is it more effective than just presenting this as an activity that will make you smarter or a better athlete? So looking at this first question, um, how many people are familiar with the Young Life organization? Good, so most of you. Um, so I want to tell you the story of Lucas. Um, Lucas is a high schooler who began attending Young Life events as a freshman in high school. Um, he was frequently under the influence of illicit drugs. He was really a boy struggling in school and struggling in life. Um, but one summer, after his sophomore year, he went to Young Life camp. Um, and at camp, he formed this new relationship with God. And after coming back from him, pretty soon his parents and teachers start to notice changes in Lucas. Um, he stopped doing drugs and drinking. Um, he had an increase in his self-esteem. His grades improved. Um, but more importantly, they noticed that he was exhibiting these really positive behaviors. He was volunteering, helping other people, treating them with kindness. Um, and even the next summer, he went and worked for free at the Young Life camp um, to help other kids come to camp and have this changing, life-changing experience. Um, and so I'm sure a lot of you have heard stories like this, right, of people who have a conversion, have a spiritual transformation, and say that they have this dramatic change in how they're living their lives. Um, but the question is, first of all, is this just a kind of one example um, or is this what typically happens when people have spiritual transformation? And then the other question is, is, what's really causing this change? Is it the fact that he changed spiritually, or is it just the fact that he found this new group that was really cool, and people liked him and accepted him? And so we sought out to look at young life and how adolescents changed in their involvement. Um, one reason we really thought out this particular sample is because we wanted to look at conversion and spiritual transformation and growth in adolescence. You find that adolescence is the most common stage of life where people experience transformations. Um, the average age of a conversion is around 15 to 16 years old. Um, and we also see in the literature that adolescents who are involved in some type of religious organization are the most likely to actually have the spiritual transformation. Um, so we went and said, well, this is a cool organization. Young Life has a ton of adolescents who are going to their summer camps. Um, and they report that about 30% of their campers have some type of religious conversion or transformation um, or recommitment to God at summer camp. And so this seemed like a really cool research opportunity. Um, you have this group of adolescents who are likely to experience a conversion in the very near future. Um, so this is a weakness of the transformation literature. It was normally people just saying, oh, I used to be this way, and now this is the way I am. But we know anyone who's studied memory in your classes, maybe the work of Elizabeth Loftus, um, would know that we can change our memories. <laughs> and we regularly don't remember things accurately. Um, and so we wanted to actually measure these adolescents before they went to camp to see what their virtues were like before the conversion. 
And so we actually collected many waves of data um, with Young Life over four different summers. Um, so I'm just going to present one of the studies we did. Um, and this was a sample um, of adolescents in the U.S. attending camp. Um, in this sample, we had 148 enrolled, but only 51 adolescents completed the whole study. So attrition is really a problem because we're following up with them a year later. Um, and you can see this was mostly Caucasian, this sample, but some Hispanic, Latino, and other minorities. And so what we did is we asked the adolescents before they went to camp to fill out a questionnaire measuring their virtues. And we use the Values in Action Inventory of Strengths for Youth. This is a measure that's been created, formed out of the positive psychology movement, measuring 24 character strengths. Um, and you find that in adolescents, um, when you do factor analyses, which is a way of kind of reducing data and trying to find out what are the meaningful groupings, um, you find that in adolescent populations, these different character strengths can be grouped under four kind of overarching virtues. So you have the virtue of intellect. Um, so this would include character strengths such as creativity, fairness, curiosity, appreciation of beauty. So these virtues that would focus on kind of your cognitions and your intellectual engagement. We also looked at theological virtues, and this is actually the term that Peterson and Seligman use, even though they aren't religious at all in their research. Um, but they noticed that these virtues center around relating to the transcendent, um, things like gratitude, forgiveness, hope, love, wisdom. Um, they also have a category of other-focused virtues. Um, kindness, teamwork, modesty, and bravery fall under this category. And the final category they have um, is the virtues of temperance. Um, these aren't necessarily all that exciting to do. It requires self-control. So things like self-regulation, perseverance, um, prudence, and honesty. And so the adolescents filled out this values in action measure. Um, and we created factor scores for each of these four virtues. We also had tried to measure somewhat successfully. It's actually quite difficult to measure spiritual transformation and change. Um, so we took a couple different approaches to look at how their spirituality was changing. Um, so the first approach we took is immediately after camp, as they're normally on the bus ride home from camp, um, we asked them, did you make a decision to commit your life to God for the first time at camp? And this is the language that the Young Life leaders gave us of how they would assess the incidence of a conversion. Um, we also asked them, did you make a decision to recommit your life to, at, to God at camp? Um, for many of these kids, they grew up in a Christian home, perhaps, but never really owned the faith as their own. And then we also indexed the change in spirituality from before camp to a year later to see, well, maybe they had this commitment at camp, but it didn't actually do anything um, to their spirituality. They forgot about it the next weekend. Um, can we look at how much they're changing in their self-reported spirituality over time? So the first thing we looked at, now I've got some statistics up here. Is this scaring people in the room? <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, we'll go through this real quick. Um, what I'm showing in this chart is the mean scores um, for the participants at time one and time three, so before camp to a year after camp. And what we wanted to look at was, is the entire sample, everyone who participated, are there some trends in the sample? Um, adolescents are changing. Is there kind of a typical developmental trajectory of all the adolescents? And I have the significant findings in bold here. And so you see that for everyone in the sample, there's an increase in intellectual virtue. So all of our adolescents are becoming a little bit more curious. Um, increasing in their love of learning. Um, this is good news. I was excited about this. Um, we wouldn't necessarily expect that. Um, we'd hope for it. I think their teachers would be really excited. Um, we also found that there was an increase for everyone in the other focused virtues. So kindness, humility, um, teamwork. The adolescents, hopefully as a part of their just general development, are acquiring these virtues. 
Okay, and then we looked at, any of you in statistics, um, these are some results of a multiple regression, a hierarchical linear regression. Some of you have, may have seen these before. And what we did was we predicted each of the virtues at time three. And so we had four different regressions here. Each column um, is a different regression. So we predicted the intellectual virtues at time three, the theological, other focused, and temperance. And in step one of each regression, we put in the virtue, that particular virtue at time one. And this is so we can actually predict the change over time. And then in step two, we entered the change in spirituality score. And what you see is that for all four virtues, if the person increased in spirituality, they also increased in these virtues. So the extent to which they increased in spirituality predicted the extent to which they would increase in all four of these virtues over time. So this would support the idea that growing spiritually does predict um, an increase in virtue. And then in step three, we entered in that item of a real, that first time or recommitment to God. And here we wanted to say, well, it's not just the spiritual growth, but it's having this kind of ecstatic or very exceptional experience at a summer camp. Does that predict additional um, increase in virtue beyond just normal spiritual growth? And we found that it did for the intellectual virtues and the theological virtues. So you got an even greater boost in virtue if you had kind of this life-changing experience, conversion experience at summer camp. And all of these effect sizes are actually pretty moderate. Um, and you see that there seems to really be something going on here. So to summarize, we find normative increases in intellectual and other focused virtues for the entire sample. Um, and that adolescents who increased in spirituality over the course of a year also increased in the four virtues we had. And finally, the incidence of a religious conversion predicted additional increases in theological and intellectual virtues. Just stop for a second. Does anyone have questions on this study? I have a clarification on mm -hmm. the linear modeling. Mm -hmm. so, um, so you're looking at, these are longitudinal data. Right. And so you're looking at um, their incidence of, of virtues to begin with on, at time so, one? Right, so time one, that's the first predictor in the regression, predicting the time three. So that's a good way to look at change. Right, so when you control for it, that actually then what you're really predicting is the change in okay. virtue. Yeah. So aside from going through a spiritual change or a recommitment to God mm -hmm. or a conversion or a reconversion, um, the, the Young Life Camp actually increased virtues aside from any spirituality or conversion. If um, we could argue that for intellectual and other focused, because everyone increased and everyone attended camp. So okay. you could make that argument that the whole sample, whatever they experienced together, may have a role in their increase in intellectual and other focused virtues. Okay, so um, basically even if, let's say I go to Young Life Camp and I didn't have a spiritual experience or a conversion right. experience, I could still increase in my intellectual and other focused virtues. Yeah, and you actually, we'd expect that you would. Okay. Um, but we don't really know if that's because of going to camp mm -hmm. or if that's just a typical developmental trajectory for this age. Mm -hmm. There's not enough research out there. So there's not a control group. Right, there's not a control group. Okay. Um, we did find, though, we looked at kind of their frequency of attendance at Young Life events. And in this sample, that wasn't a predictor when we tested that out. So we aren't sure exactly. Okay, so in regard to this first question, um, does spiritual formation and transformation predict subsequent increases in virtues? Um, our data would indicate yes, it does. Um, and we would want to look at other contexts, other types of samples to make a more broad claim, but at least in the Young Life context, um, it does seem that spiritual formation increases virtues. Um, so how about the second question? How do religiousness, spirituality, and beliefs about God increase the efficacy of self-control and patience interventions? So first I thought it might be helpful 
to give a little introduction to the specific virtues of self-control and patience and why I've really honed in on these in particular. Um, so self-control and patience, um, according to virtue ethicists, can be called instrumental virtues. Um, this means that they facilitate um, the acquisition and expression of other virtues. So let's say you want to become a more grateful person. And you've read the book by Bob Emmons. Right, we find, oh, if you gratitude journal, keep a gratitude journal, you'll probably increase in your grat gratitude. Um, but what does it take to actually make yourself sit down every night and keep a gratitude journal? What's that require? Some self-control, right? <laughs> this is actually requires you to regulate your behavior. And so self-control and patience um, help to facilitate virtue acquisition. Self-control and patience are also, I think, really important to study because they are so predictive of positive and negative life outcomes. Um, you find that self-control and patience are correlated with psychological adjustment, pathology, academic and goal achievement, um, interpersonal success, so people who have higher levels of self-control, their marriages are better. Um, this is a kind of general skill, the ability to be patient with others, the ability to regulate your own behavior, that just affects almost all of life. And I am particularly interested in self-control of patients because of their connection um, to religion and spirituality. So in the last decade, Quite a bit of research has shown that these two virtues in particular relate to religion. Um, so McCullough and Willoughby, they found that across quite a few studies in a meta-analysis that religious people have higher self-control than those who are non-religious. And the frequency of church attendance predict your levels of self-control. Um, and there are many reasons why this might be. Um, maybe people who have higher self-control choose to go to church more often. That could be one thing. Um, but they also hypothesize that perhaps certain rituals and activities that people who are religious engage, that these foster self-control. So things like maybe fasting, if any of you are practicing Lent. That requires a lot of self-control, and it might help you develop this attribute. Um, Lauren Kay and Fitzsimons, they found that your beliefs about God um, and priming God affects the way people um, perform on self-control tasks. So they found that priming an omniscient, watchful God, so if you believe and, that God is a being who watches over you and looks at your moral behaviors and cares about what you do, um, if someone has that belief and you prime the idea of God to them, you find they perform much better on temptation resistance tasks. Um, so put candy in front of them and say, this is candy for little children and you really shouldn't eat it. <laughs> Do they take a candy and eat it? You find if they've been primed with God, they resist the temptation um, and they're better at that type of task. However, they found an interesting effect with priming an all-controlling sovereign God. Um, when they activated this type of God for an individual, you found that it actually decreases active goal pursuit. Um, so if you think about self-control as pursuing goals and regulating behavior in the pursuit of goals, um, thinking about God's sovereignty and that God might control our behavior, it's actually decreased people's ability to regulate their behavior in pursuit of goals. And so they have some interesting findings here about how the view of God watching you, the view of God controlling behavior, um, can affect your own regulation of behavior. And then finally, I just wanted to study self-control and patience because these are two of the fruit of the Spirit. These are Christian virtues that have long been upheld um, and just warrant more study. I'm particularly interested in looking at self-control and patience in adolescents um, because this is ability that's really developing and in progress, really, in adolescent populations. Um, and we have a lot of research on adult self-control, self-regulation, and patience, but we have less on adolescent abilities in these areas. 
Um, in particular, adolescents' prefrontal cortices are developing. Um, this is the area that's really related to our ability to regulate behavior and have executive control. Um, and so what's happening and how can we help adolescents as they're trying to develop these abilities to regulate? Um, what could we do that would facilitate this process? And what might we do that might harm this process? It's important to look at this. Um, and we also find that the reward centers of the brain are highly active during adolescence. And so this contributes to high impulsivity. Um, and this can have long-lasting effects on a person's life if they act out these impulsive urges during adolescence. And so just to give you a bit more idea of what I mean when I talk about self-control and patience, um, when I talk about self-control, um, it's this kind of domain general resource is how I think about it, that this is something that a strength you exert, willpower. Um, and a metaphor has been put forth in the literature that self-control is like a muscle. Um, does anyone lift weights, go to the gym? Yep, right? So if you lift weights, I don't know if you, how hard you do it, but right, if you lift weights, what happens if you lift a really heavy weight? Can you keep going as long as you want? No, eventually your muscle will fatigue and you will not be able to lift any more weight. And so the idea is that self-control is this resource, it's like a muscle, and when you use it, if you use it for one sitting way too long, it's going to wear out. You'll actually become depleted and unable to keep exerting self-control. Um, so that might seem like bad news, but the good news is that, like a muscle, if you practice acting out your self-control and use this muscle, um, that it actually grows stronger. And over time, by practicing self-control, you actually have more of it and that when you're faced with a task um, where you need to regulate your behavior, you can do that for a longer period of time and more effectively. And so there's been a vast number of studies showing that engaging in activities that require self-control um, leads to increased regulation of behavior across life domains. So they have a lot of funny self-control interventions. Um, one might be, okay, for a week, I want you to use your non-dominant hand for all your activities. Have you ever even tried brushing your teeth with your non-dominant hand? Try it tonight. It's hard. <laughs> um, other activities would include things like monitoring your diet, improving your posture whenever you think about it, um, improving your mood whenever you think about it, um, regulating your speech. So sometimes they'll tell people, try not to swear for this week, or only say yes and no, not uh-huh or nah. Um, lots of different activities, but the same across them is that they require you to actually intentionally override your first impulse and the first type of behavior you want to do. And what they find is that when people engage in activities like this, um, one study they found that it actually decreased the number of cigarettes someone would smoke a day. It decreases the number of alcoholic drinks they would have. They go to the gym more often after doing this intervention. They're healthier. So that increasing self-control in one small area actually grows the muscle. It can be used in lots of different areas. And patience has gotten a lot less support in the literature, um, or just a lot less attention um, than self-control. Um, I define patience as the ability to wait calmly in the face of frustration, adversity, um, or obstacles. And we do find that undergraduates who engaged in patients training um, and teaching kind of reappraisal skills and meditation as a way to help yourself become more patient and more able to wait calmly. Um, this led to an increase in patients, an increase in positive emotions, and a decrease in depressive symptoms. And so what we've been doing the last um, year is testing out these self-control and patience interventions in adolescents. Um, and so we've been assigning adolescents to three experimental conditions. And the first, they engage in a reappraisal exercise. So we ask them, think about a negative experience from your day, um, write how you responded to it, and then write how you could think about it differently that would help it to not be such a negative experience for you. 
And the non-dominant hand condition, we assign them to use their non-dominant hand for a week. Um, since they were adolescents, we made clear to them that this should not be done with sharp knives and objects, that this is not an excuse to get out of your homework, et cetera. We have a long list of things not to do with your non-dominant hand. Um, so we didn't have any injuries. Thank goodness IRB would have been mad. But the adolescents did engage in this activity. Um, and the final activity we assigned them to do was to keep track of their schedule. So at the end of each day, to write down what you did for each half hour segment of the day. Um, and originally this had been anticipated as our control condition, um, but you'll see in our findings that this actually may have served as an intervention um, in some ways. And so the design of our study is that we have adolescents, we recruit them, um, we have them take a pretest, um, assessing their self-control, their patients, um, some of their well-being um, indices. We have them assigned to an activity for a week, and then at the end of that week, we give them a survey and see how much change there's been in their virtues. And so we've collected data from 342 participants, um, mean age around 16, and we recruited participants in charter and private schools in the LA area. Um, and we actually had a somewhat diverse sample um, not hugely, but 40%, 43% Caucasian, 21% um, Asian American, 15% Hispanic Latino, and 9% um, African American. And of the 342 participants who began the study, um, only 284 completed it. Um, so we do have some people dropping out. Uh, we tested to see if maybe one idea was, well, maybe it's only the people who have enough self-control can continue on in this study and take self-control to actually do it. Um, but we found that there was no difference in initial levels of self-control um, for those who completed the study or did not. Um, what we found that did predict whether or not they stuck with us um, was whether or not they enjoyed doing their daily activity. Um, and so that makes a lot of sense. If they actually found their activity enjoyable, they were more likely to continue. We do look at um, some religious variables in this study, and so it's important to think about what's the makeup of our sample. A lot of the schools were um, religiously affiliated. Um, so we had 65% of our sample was Protestant, 12% Catholic, 6% um, spiritual but not religious, um, and then a few atheist and agnostic. Um, we had very high religious service attendance. Um, almost 50% attended a service at least once a week, um, 24 at least once a month, 13.7 once or twice a year, um, and only 13% of our sample rarely attended religious services. So this is a pretty religious group. Um, and 85% of them believe in God or some type of higher power. And so some of the measures we gave, we measured self-control with Tangy, Baumeister, and Boone's measure. We asked about their general regulatory behaviors. So did you floss your teeth this week? Did you eat junk food? Lots of different activities and daily behaviors that would involve self-control. And then we assessed um, their patients with the three-factor patients questionnaire. And then we also assessed their subjective well-being, so life satisfaction, positive and negative affect, and then we also looked at depression symptoms. Now, we expected that it might be some important moderator variables in this study. Um, so in previous research on these positive psychology interventions, you find that the level of enjoyability of the activity and the level of perceived success um, actually makes a real difference in whether or not this activity is effective. So we enjoyed or measured enjoyability and success. And then we wanted to also measure the person's view of God's sovereignty and omniscience. And so we did this. There's no real scales at the moment to measure this, but we used some single items that Lauren Kay and Fitzsimons used. Um, so we asked participants to rate, my future success in life depends, one, completely on factors I control, to five, factors God controls. Um, and then measured God's kind of watchfulness. If God or some non-human spiritual being exists, it is likely that God watches people's behavior and notices when they misbehave. Um, so we wanted to see how people thought about God in this way. 
And so again here, like in the Young Life study, we looked at what's the mean change for all the participants who were part of our study, um, regardless of which condition they were a part of. And we found that everyone increased in patience. So maybe just being part of a study helps you become more patient as you have to put up with this annoying stuff you have to do. Um, everyone actually increased in life satisfaction. Um, and all of our participants decreased in depressive symptoms. And so then we wanted to look at, do our interventions actually lead to greater regulation of our daily activities? Um, we tested just for simple main effects, and they were not significant. Um, so then we went and looked at these moderators we had proposed and tested for interactions. And so to acquaint you with this graph, um, and we have the three conditions, the non-dominant hand condition, the daily schedule condition, and the reappraisal condition. And we have the dark blue bar is for people who said they were, had low success in doing this activity when we asked them each day. And the teal bar is people who said, yeah, I was really successful each day when I rated how successful did I do this activity. Um, and then on the far right there, I have the mean regulatory behavior at pretest. So this is where everyone started. And then the rest of the bars are the regulatory behavior at post test. So where these different groups ended up. And so there was a significant interaction here for the non-dominant hand condition. And what this graph indicates is that people who engaged in the non-dominant hand activity and felt that they did this successfully have a small increase in their regulatory behavior. So these folks are eating healthier, they're flossing more, they're not speaking out of turn, things like that. They're not using Facebook during class, right? Is anyone doing that in the room? Oh, are you regulating your behavior? <laughs> I know how this goes. Um, but it also looks like people who are in the non-dominant hand condition who weren't successful, there's a small decrease um, compared to pretest in the regulatory behavior. And this was actually a little bit surprising for us. We didn't expect this. Um, and what we think might be going on is that engaging in this non-dominant hand activity might be so depleting for them that they don't have any self-regulation left over to just engage in their daily activities. And just to clarify, the non-dominant hand is the patient intervention condition? Um, it could be, it probably do both. Um, we, right, we didn't clear it super clearly. The non-dominant hand, though, is used for self-control in particular, okay. that it increases your moral, your self-control muscle okay. is what they really expect. Mm -hmm. Although it can also increase patience because you have to be patient with yourself as you're doing it. More so than the reappraisal condition. Is that yeah, we think of the reappraisal a bit more as the patient's condition, okay. um, that you're learning to regulate your emotions mm -hmm. and deal with frustrating circumstances. We, so then here we're looking, same type of graph, looking at levels of patience at post-test. Um, and in this interaction, we actually find that there is a significant effect for the daily schedule tracking, um, which if you recall is supposed to be our control condition. <laughs> but what we see here is that when people felt really successful at the daily schedule tracking, they actually increase in their patience. Um, and what we think, so in adults, you find that just writing down what you did each day doesn't really affect you. Um, but we think for adolescents, this might actually be a somewhat novel exercise to assess how they spent their time each day and to really think that through and to think about how am I tracking my behavior? Oh, I spent four hours playing video games today. Hmm, this might affect their patients and help them to better think about time and how long things take. Um, is our thought. Um, and there's a trend for non-dominant hand um, to also increase patients if it's successful, but that wasn't actually significant. We also wanted to see how these interventions would affect subjective well-being. Um, so here we have life satisfaction at post-test and the different conditions. Um, and if you recall, there's, first of all, a significant main effect. So everyone in our study increased in life satisfaction. 
Um, but what you also see here is there's a significant interaction for the non-dominant hand condition and reappraisal. And it's the interaction with enjoyability. And so if you enjoy doing your activity, so if you enjoy actually trying to use your non-dominant hand for the week, or enjoy writing out reappraisals of how you could think about circumstances differently, um, then you had a pretty large increase in life satisfaction um, because of those activities. Um, but if you did not enjoy them, you didn't increase all that much in life satisfaction from doing that activity for the week. Um, and then you see for daily schedule tracking, it doesn't actually matter if you enjoyed it or not. It doesn't have that much of an impact on life satisfaction. Also looking at positive affect, um, here you see that there's an interaction for that non-dominant hand condition again. This is where we're really seeing most of the action. Um, if you felt like you were successful doing the non-dominant hand condition, um, then you actually show an increase in positive affect as a result of the activity. Um, but again, not successful, a small decrease in positive affect. And finally, looking at negative affect, so your negative emotions that you report, um, we see that um, there's a significant interaction for both, for this reappraisal condition. So this one is a little strange, and we're still trying to figure out what exactly it means. Um, what you find is that if you thought you weren't successful, if you're low on your success rating for reappraisal condition, that's when you have a decrease in negative affect. Um, not the high success. And so this is a little confusing. We think that if you thought you were successful at doing this, it would help you to manage your emotions. But it's no, the people think they're not successful. They are actually helping to decrease their negative emotions. Um, and what we think might be going on is that the people who feel like they're not successful, this is a really challenging activity doing these reappraisals. And they might be the people who need it the most. <laughs> And so it might actually be helping them, even though they feel like it's a really difficult thing to do, to think about circumstances in a new way to make it less of a negative circumstance. And we basically see the same pattern with depression, depression symptoms. So it's the people that are low in success in the reappraisal condition, they see a decrease um, in their depression symptoms. Um, but if you recall, also, everyone de decreased in depression symptoms for this sample, um, all three conditions. So the last thing we looked at was, OK, let's get back to the religious ideas here. So how is someone's belief in God affect these interventions? So the interventions seem to be working. There's some interesting moderations going on, some that we don't even expect. But what about God concept? How does that affect how these interventions work with a person. And so what we found here is that for the non-dominant hand condition, if you have this view of God that he's watching our behavior all the time and cares about what we do and is paying attention to it, then your self-control increases and, and you're in the non-dominant hand condition. Um, so it seems that this ability to kind of resist temptation resist the urge to use your dominant hand and use your non-dominant hand, that's more effective when you think God is watching you. Um, so this supports Lauren K. and Fitzsimons' argument that a watching God increases temptation resistance. And further supports the idea that maybe this is why religious people have higher self-control, because they have their concept activated quite often and have God, no God is, cares about what they do. So what are some conclusions we can draw from all this research? Um, first conclusion is that using simple interventions, we can help adolescents increase their self-control. Um, but we have to make sure that they're successful at doing this. And we also want to make these enjoyable. So we'd want to think about dosing, not making the intervention too difficult for an individual, giving them kind of just the right amount of an intervention. Um, also, views of God as omniscient matter for self-control. And back, thinking back to our Young Life study, we've talked about that spiritual transformation and religious conversion predict the development of virtues. So the next steps 
that we are putting into place right now um, is to, okay, so we have some interventions, um, particularly this non-dominant hand condition intervention um, seems to change self-control. So what happens if we frame this activity in different ways for different participants? So for some of our participants, we say, this is an activity using your non-dominant hand that can help you to grow spiritually. This is a spiritual fruit, self-control, and we want you to do this thing that's a little bit difficult because you want to grow in your faith. Other participants, we say, hey, this activity will help make you a better athlete and a better student. That's why you're doing it, using your non-dominant hand. Um, and then others, we say, well, this is going to make you a better person, a more moral person, and help develop your character. Um, so kind of in between the two, of having a moral component but not actually having that spiritual component. And we're collecting data right now to see if the framing of this intervention actually affects how well it works. And our expectation is that the interventions framed as spiritual activities um, will be more efficacious. And another area we want to explore is to think about how different spiritual disciplines and rituals might actually be kind of real life interventions. So do people who fast for Lent, do they increase in self-control compared to people who don't fast for Lent? Um, the people who tithe, which requires a lot of self-control, giving away your money, um, do you find that they have more patience and self-control? Um, things like daily devotions, maybe prayer, um, reframing of suffering that happens in a religious context. How do these things affect the formation of virtues? Um, and I'd hope, too, as we're starting to do more of this work at Fuller, um, could some of the research maybe even inform how we go about doing these rituals. Is there a certain discussion that needs to happen in a church when we participate in Lent that might actually make this Lenten practice more effective in growing our spiritual fruit? Um, and we also really want to, at some point, look at this in other contexts. So is this really a Christian phenomenon? Our samples have been mostly Christian so far. Would you see this happen with other religions, that self-control, patience, other virtues can increase from involvement? Um, and the other thing we're trying to do is to take some of these activities and start to develop some smartphone apps. So how can we actually package some of these interventions for virtues in a way that adolescents might do them? Um, this is one of our future down-the-road activities as a center that we're working on. And so that's all I have for us today. Um, but I want to thank my collaborators on these different projects and the online project, uh, Bob Evans and Justin Barrett. Um, and then for some of my grad students who have really been a big part of this work. And of course, the John Templeton Foundation for, for uh, funding actually both of these studies. Um, so thank you for being a great audience. <laughs>